to good evening to everyone and uh, welcome to to the first DG's webinar on five years of the Paris Agreement and how to accelerate the implementation of the sustainable development goals and more specifically uh, SDG 13 climate action. Uh, my name is Sina Zanoki. I am a co-founder of and uh, I will be the moderator uh, of today's event. Um, so we decided to, to organize this event to really have a moment and on, on what are the areas where we uh, succeeded, uh, where, what are the areas where we need to uh, where we need to do more and really what are the next concrete steps to foster climate action broadly sustainability uh, in the and uh, I can say that really this discussion couldn't be uh, timelier as there are really important uh, policy milestones coming up uh, next week European level we have the, the next uh, European Council and governments uh, will discuss uh, increased uh, EU climate targets uh, concerning the greenhouse gas emission reduction. And we also have the Climate Ambition Summit in the United uh, Nations next week, where this discussion will go to the international stage. So we are very happy to have you here and welcome to the event. Uh, the event will kick off with a keynote um, by my colleague, uh, co-founder and president of V4SDG, uh, Andras Wollom. But just before giving the floor to Andras, um, a quick practical information. So throughout the session, uh, the attendees can raise questions uh, using uh, the Q&A function. So please submit your questions um, and, and there will be a dedicated uh, time to to respond to them and now without further ado I would like to invite you Andras to deliver um, welcoming words and uh, and deliver your keynote thank you thank you very much Christy I hope you can hear me all right and uh, the connection will not be too sloppy I am in uh, in Turkey right now and uh so um, uh, the connection is 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 not not the best. So, uh, dear speakers, um, uh, dear guests, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Good evening. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a great honor to welcome you all on behalf of V4SDG Visegrad for Sustainability, which is the first organization led and built by young professionals that works towards the enhancement of sustainability cooperation between the countries of the Visegrad Group the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia. Today, we are celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, which is the avant-garde of the international community towards stopping climate change. I still remember marveling at the picture of the COP21 presidency um, holding their hands up um, uh, in the air when the deal was adopted. Um, to me, um, uh, as a first year student of international relations at the time, it felt nothing short of historic. Just a few months prior, I remember listening to Chabaku Ibeshi, um, uh, the chair of the UN Open Working Group on the SDGs, uh, saying that he gave about a 20% chance to Addis Ababa, Agenda 2030, and Paris succeeding together. And uh, with that last hurdle cleared, it was a moment of hope. I think, and then truly cautious optimism. And now we know that we were up for a quite mixed reality check. In the past five years, we watched the United States leave the agreement, stood by as multilateral cooperation broke down on multiple levels and experienced the further expansion of harmful emissions accompanied by horrible examples of natural degradation. On the other hand, we also witnessed the birth of a strong climate movement spearheaded by the young generations, the emergence of novel technologies that can help us defeat climate change and the gradual mainstreaming of the climate discourse into politics and policymaking. Um, while we experience setbacks, I think that on balance, uh, we have made solid progress and that's something we can build up on. 
if we grasp the mantle of implementation. And the time could not be riper. After COVID, uh, we will have an opportunity to drastically rethink how we operate as the human species. Um, with the election of Joe Biden as the United States is returning to the negotiating table, more and more countries are racing to announce their ambitions and plans for carbon and climate neutrality, even some more or less significant polluters. Finally, it seems that we are really reaching the point where we can enter a decade of action, not planning. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the European Union too. Throughout the past years, we have emerged as a crucial actor of climate action. While far from perfect, we have passed the European Green Deal and stepped up our ambitions on emissions reductions, leading the world by example towards sustainability. With no drastic improvement of US-China relations on the horizon, the EU could act as a more neutral galvanizer of climate efforts, finally becoming the number one in a defining issue of global affairs. But the window is closing. If we do not maintain momentum, eventually the other large powers will take on the issue. And to maintain this momentum, we need unprecedented internal unity and support behind climate action and sustainability. Certainly some more support from the Eastern member states of the EU as well. While our policies have shifted considerably towards a greener approach, there is still space for improvement. The V4 in particular should embrace this agenda um, uh, for without our action, there will be no European unity on this topic. And thus we would deprive ourselves of a huge collective win for the community as a whole. But embracing sustainability at the heart of cooperation would be beneficial for the V4 itself as well, and not only from a developmental perspective. I think that in the recent months, we have seen certain political rifts emerging between the Czech Republic and Slovakia on the one side and Hungary with Poland on the other. As a result of that, there is growing murmur of abandoning the V4 cooperation format. To me, this reaction represents that beyond occasional political co-working, not enough has been invested in connecting our countries and communities, even though the potential for deeper, closer regional integration would hold considerable benefits. In other words, until the V4 remains an ad hoc political grouping, it will remain unstable and far from reaching its maximum potential. Turning our focus towards sustainability cooperation could help us establish permanent foundations for the V4 cooperation that would extend beyond the ideologies of governments that eventually come and go. To ensure um, effective regional development, this is a must. Eastern Europe needs its own Nordics or Benelux states and climate action, sustainability could be the key to it. Of course, at v 4 SDG, that is what we are working on. Taking our communities into a better, responsible, inclusive 21st century by bringing our countries closer together across different levels and sectors to strengthen sustainability. We strongly believe that actors of sustainability can fill the bare bone of the V4 with real substance. From the bottom up, turning the ship of our partnership in a new direction. The V4 is and should be much more than its official presence. It is built by us collectively. And youth plays a crucial role in this. And let me emphasize that point. We are now here not only as activists, but increasingly as partners, collaborators, advisors, entrepreneurs, politicians, and consultants too. I'm really glad that among our panelists tonight, we also welcome Vladislav Kaim, who is part of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change, and is also a fellow v 4 sdg member. I think he's a great example of why decision makers should be more open to the idea of taking youth on board with policymaking. Um, he's bringing tangible value and great ideas to the table, and we need them so that we can build sustainability collectively. And with this, I think my time is coming to an end, so I will conclude. Let me thank our panelists in advance for joining us today. I'm really honored that V4SDG will share this 
very important discussion with them on, on uh, this crucial topic. And I hope that by the end of the evening, we will all know better how to make sure that we reach the ambition of the Paris Agreement, how the EU will become the global leader on climate action, and how the V4 can work harder and better towards it, because all three of these are a must, at least for me. Thank you, Andras, um, for your very inspiring uh, speech. And now uh, we would like to continue uh, tonight's event with our panel discussion. So um, as mentioned earlier, we are very pleased to welcome our panelists. And once again, thank you for accepting our invitation to discuss how to, how to accelerate the implementation on, on, on climate action and more widely sustainability. So uh, before we kick off the discussion, I would like to briefly uh, introduce our panelists. We are ready to welcome Dr. Barbara Botos, uh, Deputy State Secretary for Climate Action from the Ministry for Innovation and Technology. Uh, welcome, Barbara. Tonight, uh, also Dr. Uh, is with us, who is the executive chair at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability uh, Leadership uh, Brussels. Um, also, warm welcome to Anelia Stefanova, who is program director at CE uh, Bankwatch uh, Net. As I mentioned, we are, we are very pleased to have Vladislav Kaim, who is not only a member of our organization, but he's a member of the Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change to uh, the UN Secretary General. So thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, to all the panelists. So um, now looking back uh, to the past five years since the, the Paris Agreement was adopted, uh, my question is that how you would assess the implementation of climate action and more broadly Agenda 2030 uh, in the region and if you would like to um, have a comment on more the European level. So um, I would like to then first Deputy Secretary, to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much and welcome everybody, especially those who join our panel discussion virtually. I think this is a historical moment. Before the adoption of the Paris Agreement, there were ongoing discussions in the field of sustainability and climate change. But I do think that the Paris Agreement determined the overall goal since the Paris Agreement strengthened the relationships between our countries within the Visegrad Four, and we have to continue this way because climate change shows an accelerating trend as well. And we have to keep uh, pace with this uh, phenomenon. But to your questions, so how we would assess the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in the region. Under the Agenda 2030, National reports assess the progress and identify the challenges at the national level in terms of every single SDG. Uh, but these also give an outlook on the regional and global level as well. According to the assessments, the countries of the Visegrad 4 region perform uh, on average in achieving global sustainability goals, which I think is a very good uh, result so far. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, now, Martin, um, I turn to you. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. And um, uh, I much appreciate the opportunity to be with you here. Uh, and actually, just picking up on uh, what Andras uh, said about uh, the historic moment, I was uh, fortunate enough to be in Paris uh, five years ago and shared exactly the same impression of what an amazing moment of hope uh, it was. Uh, and actually how much has changed in those five years. But obviously, as Barbara said, not enough, and there is still a huge amount to do, not just in the V4, but across Europe and indeed, obviously, the rest of the world. Um, and I guess from, from that perspective, I have two uh, ways to look at the, the way progress has been made in, in the V4, but also more broadly in the meantime. 
The first is, is to be very clear headed about the fact that we are very unsustainable at the moment and we were in 2015 and we are still a very long way from true sustainability and even meeting the 2030 goals would leave some way to go on climate change amongst other things. And I think it's worth remembering that being on the path and on the transition towards sustainability is not the same as having achieved it. And we are making some progress along the path, but we are not there yet. And we, we should not uh, kid ourselves that this is a huge and long process and um, we have some way to go uh, yet. Um, so that's the, uh, the recall of, of the um, enormity of what we're uh, undertaking and the necessity for, for so doing. Um, that said, I, I think as well, if you look at the, uh, the reporting of what has been achieved in the V4 at, at EU level uh, more broadly, there are areas clearly of progress um, and they are very welcome because obviously uh, it's better to go forwards than, than backwards in these areas. Uh, and the framework is, is extremely useful for uh, enabling us to think about this and to try and uh, correct the, the sort of development path that we have undertaken in, uh, in Europe as well as elsewhere. Um, I think the, uh, the progress is probably more mixed on climate than on some of the other areas. Um, and we can maybe talk about that uh, in due course as well in more detail. But I guess in, in terms of the V4 specifically, it's also worth reminding us when we're talking about this in a European context and a global context, that uh, you know, those countries are also part of the EU, of course, and the EU itself has been at least in, in the policy discussion at the leading edge of trying to, to make progress on this. And it's part of being part of that is uh, a significant contribution, of course, as well. Um, and therefore, relatively speaking, it's, um, you know, the region is, is part of uh, you know, a, a European region more broadly, which is um, at the forefront of, uh, of trying to set the right level of ambition. We're not there yet, but uh, taking significant uh, steps towards doing that. And as Christina said, we've got some significant moments coming up in the next uh, few days even. Um, and that is obviously very welcome, but we can talk uh, later on about how much more remains to be done and what to do about it. But uh, um, it's, it's certainly better than it was in 2015 uh, in the V4 amongst us, uh, uh, the, the other European countries. But we do have a huge amount more to do. Um, but there is a good reason for uh, a degree of optimism, I think, about why we should be doing it and the benefits that will come from it in the short as well as the longer term. Let me leave it at that for now. Thank you, Martin. And now, if you could, uh, if you could comment on 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 the civil society. Um, sorry, you give the floor to me, right? Yes. <laughs> there was some interruption in the connection. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, I'm really pleased to be part of this event, and uh, thank you very much for inviting. See Bankwatch Network, who is um, a network of environmental NGOs working in um, Central and East Europe. Our focus is very much on uh, on, on public finance, and uh, but we are, yeah, we, as I said, we are grassroots environmental groups. And um, as uh, my previous uh, predecessor spoke about the historical moment, I could not only I could just agree on that. It's really a historical moment also because we we have a combination of uh, finally. Uh, big changes in terms of uh, commitment, European commitment uh, to advance the, the climate objectives. Um, recently, we yeah we just in in front of the discussion about uh, bringing the 55% targets um, for all of us um, as an objective for 2030, and in the same time we we have historical opportunity of matching that with enormous amount of resources. Um, and therefore, I would like to bring the role of the public participation and uh, the public as uh, citizens uh, very much linked to that historical moment. I mean, Bankwatch focus on the on the resources on the public finance uh, as a, as a way to to change our um, uh, economies. And this was the way this was 25 years ago. The main uh, leverage. And again. The, the, the uh, historical recovery and resilience um, facility and um, uh, new EU budget would be a substantial amount of our budgets in the next um, um, next years. 
Uh, therefore, it opened the, the, the opportunity for uh, for us as a citizens to participate and take and make sh shaping that in a different way. And uh, again, Paris agreement alignment with Paris mean substantial change in the way we live, in the way we. We have our cities built and we have the way our economy is designed and um, in the way our energy system is, is run. Um, so we, we do need to go to this transformation and, um, and we do need the ownership of people. We need to ownership of business about that. So uh, here I see the role of the, um, the civil society very much in the, in, the, um, in the way of informing, first of all, because of the opportunities. We always, um, we as environmental groups, we always believe that uh, Reaching the climate objectives is a, is a huge opportunity for Central and East Europe, for the Visegrad countries and um, Central and East Europe, because we have a lot of low hanging fruits. I mean, we should not hide behind the fact that we are a poorest country or poorer than the Western Europe, or we, we because we could do much better. We we have a lot of um, I mean, smart technologies also and and business uh, business solutions which are developed, and and therefore um, we we do work on on collecting with examples, showing that indeed Eastern Europe could do much better. And um, this is a real opportunity for our uh, for for our autonomies. Um, so we should not be we should not be flying low or uh, and go and do be be more ambitious on climate objectives. And this is also a moment for um, citizens or and young organizations like yours to really be closer to the regional and local level. Like what works on just transition and this we have regions which need to go to this kind of dramatic change and uh, leaving out coal behind and, uh, and moving towards new solutions. And uh, often this is, includes capacity and support for local authorities, for uh, expertise. And again, we, we do believe we have a lot of that uh, to offer in, um, I mean, from the civil society sector, from think tanks, for, uh, from Central East Europe to really support this transition. And, um, and currently this could be also matched with substantial resources, again, I said, between 20 and 40 percent of GDP of the sea of the sea countries will be supported by the recovery and the resilience uh, fund. So um, we are looking forward for indeed this new role for the civil society and um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Anelia and uh, Vladislav, uh, if you could share your thoughts from from the youth perspective. Thank you very much, Christina. And first of all, uh, Hello to every v 4 sdg who is watching us and all the guests. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, the perspective I'm sharing uh, within this webinar is also not just youth, but also a little bit from the outside V4. So or should I say the neighbor of V4 because I myself come from Republic of Moldova. And uh, in terms of uh, if, we to, if we take a look at progress on sustainability, I think uh, if we have to start from more encouraging moments, I think, first of all, we should uh, take a stock of the fact that uh, the only COP that happened in Europe, uh, you know, east of Bonn, was in V4. And uh, unarguably, so far, we can say that this is the last COP that is remembered by those who participated in it with uh, least frustration, probably since Paris. So I think, and uh, the symbolism of it, that of all places it happened in uh, Katowice, uh, basically, the coal capital of Poland is also not lost on that, uh, which means that there is a growing realization among uh, the policymakers and uh, activists who are pushing policymakers uh, to that, that uh, the role of V4 and the wider Eastern Europe uh, is in uh, becoming the European laboratory for just transition, basically. Uh, because if we look at the economic evolution of our region since uh, the fall of communism, we can see that this sort of um, linearity of production and consumption and a little bit of this mentality in economic development of the heavier the better in terms of the industry it was more or less kept in most places and uh, the sources of the sources of growth that our model found, found since then were still based on this in this assumption which would uh, made uh, the further transition significantly more difficult and so now that uh, v4 is more in the spotlight for being one of the pretty important economic engines in the EU, sort of the onus is uh, on uh, those in power in V4 to prove that they can actually reinvent their economies in a way that uh, they may have a uh, shortcut around uh, 
uh, in the first wave of reforms that say happened in the 1990s. And uh, from the youth perspective, I see the role of youth uh, as um, catalyzers of local action first and foremost, because as uh, Anelia uh, rightfully mentioned, the, the just transition is particularly about local action. And uh, without youth as activists, and what is also important, youth as professionals in their fields, uh, this uh, transition is bound to fail. And uh, when we talk about uh, context of just transition in uh, SDGs, I think what is extremely important for V4 also is that just transition is not should not only be about say SDG 13, it should also be SDG 4, SDG 2 on steroids basically, because uh, in order for us to see coal regions, steel regions, uh, whatever others, to transition to the green economy regions, we also need to make sure that uh, there are institutions and schemes in place to help young people train into green jobs, which are multiple, uh, more like if we took, at the usual taxon uh, took a look at the usual taxonomies, there are more than we think. They don't only are uh, not only silent in certain industries. And what's also important, help those who already have a lot of experience, who are saying their 30s, 40s, 50s, to reskill and upskill fast and uh, also maintain and improve their human capital. Because that's why the challenge that V4 and wider Eastern European countries face in the context of uh, sustainable development right now is a dual one. Uh, we are facing a threat both to our human and natural capital. And so any action that aims uh, to be an efficient climate action should also be action that is uh, directed towards improving our human capital. And that's why, as a, to wrap it up here, I'm a little uh, surprised by the fact that if we take a look at the negotiations at uh, the European Council since, say, July, that uh, V4, some of the V4 countries uh, didn't choose uh, the Just Transition Fund as the hill to die on. Uh, because even though we see now raging debates going on on other matters, uh, for instance, the Just Transition Fund was significantly cut in the meanwhile. Uh, and even though it remains substantial in, say, in the uh, framework, or even the multi-annual financial framework, it's still less that could have been. And uh, the very last point is that please remember that uh, other countries in Eastern Europe, countries of the Eastern Partnership, are always looking at you and taking note of what you're doing. And uh, East EAP countries are always uh, looking for allies, especially now when it comes to the Green Deal, and they are looking to V4 for allyship, because uh, as uh, Ursula von der Leyen said herself, the role of the EU Green Deal is to make a carbon neutral continent by 2050. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vlad, and and it's really great that you that you emphasised uh, the inclusivity and that we shouldn't really only talk about the V4, but more broadly as uh, Europe as, as a continent when we uh, when we would like to achieve the the goals of the 2030 agenda. So thank you for your remarks, and uh, now I would like to move on to the next section of our discussion when I would like to ask a bit more specific questions to each of our panelists. And first, uh, I would have uh, a question to Deputy State Secretary, um, to Deputy Secretary. The, so as we could see in the past, um, uh, I hope you can hear me well in the meantime, because uh, it says my internet is unstable. <laughs> um, apologies for this. So, uh, so at, if you look at the, the past uh, 30 years and how the Visegrad countries were successful, a successful example of regional cooperation, uh, for instance, when we uh, when we talk about the, the common aspiration that led to the EU and, and NATO access, accession, uh, I would like to ask you that uh, how do you see the relevance of our region uh, in, in the process of implementing uh, climate action and sustainability? And also if you could reflect on the intergovernmental uh, nature of these issues. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I think the Visegrad Corporation is committed to sustainable development, and this is clearly reflected in the, in the current Polish Visegrad for Presidency program. And the relevant ministries of the V4 countries hold regular consultations on sustainable development, plus the Visegrad Corporation is open to third countries in Visegrad 4 plus so that the issues of sharing good practices and achieving sustainable development goals can be discussed. Um, the Visegrad four countries play an important role in the Central and Eastern European region. There is an already existing uh, political, economic and social connection between these countries, which could be a very good basis for further cooperation. The SDG 17 is about strengthening the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development. Many in innovations required from the implementation of the goals have to be cross-border initiatives, especially in the fields of renewable energy, achieving climate neutrality, circular economy, establishing common education and training programs. As a good example for cross-border initiative, the Carpathian Convention could be mentioned. The Carpathian Convention was adopted and signed in May 2003 in Kiev by seven parties, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Serbia, uh, Slovak Republic and Ukraine, and it was entered into force in January 2006. It is the only multi-level governance mechanism covering the whole Carpathian area of the, uh, for the protection and sustainable development of a mountain region worldwide. In the convention, there are several thematic groups such as biodiversity, uh, large carnivores, spatial development, water and river basins, agriculture and rural development, forests, tourism, industry, energy, transport and infrastructure, cultural heritage and traditional knowledge, assessment and monitoring, awareness raising, education and participating in climate change. And just um, a few words about how I see um, uh, uh, it uh, accelerated in the future. I do think that the progress in the key SDGs is essential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving our ability to adapt to the consequences we are already facing. At the same time, progress on climate change is also essential for achieving SDGs, including good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation. And the current COVID-19 crisis is an opportunity for a profound systematic shift to a more sustainable economy that works for both people and the planet. The V4, and I think um, Anelia said it, and also Vladislav, that uh, the V4 climate and energy policy is in line with the SDG 13 target, taking into account the principle that leaves no one behind. This is also some kind of just transition principle. This is a key aspect within this region, and we have a historical knowledge on that on economic recovery from unsustainable forms of economic production, production from the previous systems. And this is a, a resource, a resource, a very valuable resource of experience that could be used for the upcoming green and digital transition that is ahead of us under the new Green Deal. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Barbara. And um, a bit reflecting on on what you mentioned, that's really now that we are in, in a crisis situation, and and really the way forward is a green, um, a green and and a just uh, recovery. And I think a, a very related question to this is what I would like to address to to Martin. That now that we have uh, this momentum. Uh, how we how we turn it to our our competitive uh, advantage. So, as the notion of competitive sustainability has been uh, um, is has been quite uh, often referred uh, these days on 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 European and also global level. And I would like to ask you if you could elaborate on the interlinkages between competitiveness and sustainability and and uh, how it looks like on, on on a regional level and also from a european point of view yes and i think um uh, i will pick up on uh, what anilia said for example about all of the uh the opportunity that exists in the v4 and elsewhere uh, in europe to uh, to make a benefit effectively out of this uh, transition so for people for their societies and obviously the economy as well uh, there is a huge amount of um, benefit that we can see coming from this transition. 
And I think what we have seen uh, since the uh, adoption of the Paris Agreement, but more recently in Europe, the, the adoption of the European Green Deal, and the Commission starting to use this idea of competitive sustainability is that we've, we've really understood much better that not only do uh, emissions reductions and economic development go hand in hand, but actually if you're at the leading edge of that transformation, you stand to benefit even more from many of these processes, particularly if, as several of you have said, you, you pay the right attention to the social dimension of that transition. Um, but the, uh, the thing that has changed, I think, in uh, actually just in the last few months um, that also Andras referred to uh, is the fact that the, the goal of climate neutrality by mid-century is now not one that just the EU has set itself, but we can see other major economies around the world also now setting the same objective. And that makes it much more of a race to the top than a question of whether or not we lose marginal advantage during the transition, which has been an understandable preoccupation for, for many uh, over the last few years. But that is changing and the potential to, uh, to develop um, industries in those new markets that will develop uh, in the B4, across the EU as a whole, across the continent, in fact, as a whole, but also globally, is uh, a, a, of enormous interest. And if you are able to develop uh, early and with the right investment, then there is obviously an enormous potential to generate the jobs, which will address some of the just transition uh, question, which has uh, been raised, but also uh, concentrate those jobs in areas maybe which are most affected by some of those transitions, but also uh, enable uh, the development to go across a whole region. Many of these transitions have to be looked at beyond a single country. And therefore, uh, I would totally agree with those who've said the regional approach here lends itself to the best type of um, sort of economic and social thinking for success. Uh, some of these issues are pan-European and need to be dealt with at, at that level. Uh, some will be national and, and local, uh, but there's clearly potential in some of this uh, to look at a regional approach uh, where you will get the benefits of transboundary cross-border collaboration um, and indeed then the, the corollaries through the industrial um, uh, value chains and employment associated. So the, the notion of competitive sustainability, I think, is becoming uh, better understood by uh, the European Commission in particular uh, and is likely to apply it uh, through its industrial strategy, for example. That may be relevant also to the way it looks at the funding and the recovery um, that is available in uh, the short term. Um, and I think the, the linkage of uh, these issues together uh, offers a huge uh, opportunity uh, now for, for the V4 as well as others uh, in the EU to show how um, you make a success of the just transition, but also uh, succeed in bringing uh, you know, the emissions down so rapidly, uh, but, but demonstrating you can do that economically uh, uh, in a way which puts you at the leading edge of, of the new economy, rather than feeling that you're, you're struggling to, to, to catch up or uh, somehow keep up uh, with others. So uh, I think this is um, a, a time has, has come now for this region and, and the EU to demonstrate that in practice. Uh, and the investment, I think others have mentioned, uh, that is available now is a once in a lifetime opportunity to channel huge amounts of public funding, link it to private funding to make that uh, significant investment come to life really over the next um, uh, you know, months and, and uh, the short term uh, in order to deliver the decade of action, I think, that, that Andras mentioned as well. So uh, I think the time has come for this uh, to be brought to life um, and I look forward to seeing it in this region as well as elsewhere. Thank you, Martin. And yes, as you said, really delivering the, the ambition, uh, we, we need to be inclusive and, and we need more cooperation across uh, different, uh, different sectors of the, of the society. So now, um, in order to discuss this a bit more in detail, I would turn to, to, to Anelia. So as, as representative from, from the civil sector, I would like to ask you how uh, you assess uh, the role of, of uh, the civil society when it comes to, to the implementation uh, of, of climate action, climate ambitions, and also um, regarding the Paris Agreement, how do you see uh, how it changed the narrative uh, on this topic? Um, 
I think the yeah, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm coming from environmental NGOs, and then um, environmental movement um, always uh, was is very much connected to the sustainability, sustainable development, because we see this um, uh, connection between economic development, uh, social development, and um, uh, and uh, environmental benefits, not as a trade-off, but as something which mutually benefit each other, and um, and we more and more convinced that uh, we could not resolving one crisis by creating another one. Therefore, we do need um, a dialogue and solutions which um, which are inclusive and which are participatory and are the best solutions. And therefore, I mean, we often are the one which, um, which are rather um, uh, rising alarms and concerns about the impacts. Uh, but uh, because again, I, I believe very much that there's no trade-off. Uh, often what is the best for environment is also the best for people. And uh, more and more we see now that uh, with the, also with the climate discussion, um, issues uh, which are would be really the best benefit for um, achieving our climate objectives, uh, like energy efficiency, is one of the the thing the the areas to develop uh, and um, and it will be reducing our footprint, reducing our uh, energy consumption, which uh, would allow us to indeed um, um, make the reduction of CO two yeah CO two reduction, but in the same time uh, would be would be also allow not to expand uh, export the pressure. To let's say unsustainable renewables or solutions, which could be, uh, I mean, energy solutions which are not a, not yet uh, fully developed. And in the third, but not last, but uh, energy efficiency is sorting out the energy poverty, which is a huge issue in the region. And again, back to what Martin said, I think we it's a really for the before region, which is the welfare part of the sea countries to show an example. Um, we follow closely like Czech Republic, which is a, a great example of energy efficiency measures um, uh, in, in a massive, in, employed in a massive way. And this could be an, 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 a great inspiration for the countries where to go and how to develop sort of similar, similar approaches. Uh, because reduction for us is the first thing to do. I mean, reduction of, cons of uh, resource use, reduction of the um, of the consumption, um, which not necessarily mean as bring us back to the, to the uh, which many people are concerned, but reduction uh, made in a smart and, and uh, way that would in improve our well-being, uh, because it would be very difficult to replace what we have currently as consumption models with uh, alternative solutions or, or renewable solutions. Um, and and here, the, um, yeah, we we do work on on bringing partnership and bank watch i mean is one of the example working on just transition regions for broad partnership between uh, environmental groups and trade unions and social social groups and local communities to really look for what will be the best uh, solution uh, because um, I, I only could agree with um, with previous speakers that we need to be looking for regional cooperation I mean solutions are locally based but they need to be globally shared because we need to learn from each other and and um, employ our examples there is much more similarity between Slovakia and Czech Republic in the way approaching the things than probably between uh, Slovakia and Austria I mean uh, I don't want to but the, to <laughs> yeah to, to um, yeah to discourage, of course, the uh, partnership with uh, the Western Europe, but uh, there is a lot to learn in, the, in in our region among sea countries. And we, we do believe that the civil society has an important role of sharing this experience and, and bring, building this partnership. Thank you, Anelia. And uh, I think another, uh, another very important actor is really the youth in this uh, in this process and uh, i remember last year at the at the climate action summit when when the secretary general um said to us to the youth uh that now the world leaders should be the the keynote listeners um instead of keynote speakers and that we really we really need to be part of the of the decision making process and i'm i'm very i'm very pleased that that vladislav he's he's part of uh the secretary general's youth advisory group on climate change so uh vladislav how do you see the role of youth uh, in the implementation process 
and uh, and also could you please elaborate on on your work as as the advisory group and and tell us um, a bit about this thank you yeah absolutely i'll just uh, begin with a little bit uh, broader context like more the first part of your question i think uh, the role of youth in implementation is uh, only growing uh, particularly thanks to the external pressure on the system uh, through activism. Uh, but what we are lacking still is uh, the ability to be in the room when it happens and where it happens. And uh, this is uh, why it is extremely important for not only V4, but for us in the broader region, uh, both through activism and uh, various participatory mechanisms to put a V4 and Central and Eastern Europe on, on, uh, on global climate map. Uh, because if we look, for instance, at the trends that we see right now in uh, youth advocacy for climate, we see a growing importance of uh, such designation as uh, MAPA, uh, most affected people in areas. And uh, uh, this uh, actually, this classification played a role in how uh, votes were distributed at uh, MOC COP26 that uh, has just finished. And it is extremely important uh, that we have enough uh, young people in our region who are professional and committed enough to articulate uh, our climate case to the rest of the community in order to recognize that uh, our region is a prime example of MAPA as well. Uh, for many reasons, for uh, how we are suffering still from uh, the heavy industry bias from the communist times, uh, continuing with uh, increasing uh, floods and droughts, and so on and so forth, and uh, also the interlinkages between climate and peace uh, in our region, like for instance, it is the case uh, in uh, the Donbas region in Ukraine. Uh, so it is extremely important uh, that uh, in uh, the youth sphere, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, as share sort of, of youth population in terms of activist involvement gets to the levels of Western Europe, but also that um, participation in the higher sort of echelons of uh, climate policy making is also enhanced. And I'm glad in this context that uh, we have uh, such a panelist as uh, Dr. Botos here because uh, it would be good to share a good practice with you at uh, the Young Youth Climate Summit that uh, Christina and me were part of. Um, me and a few colleagues of mine from different countries, we launched a framework that was dedicated to how it should be launched in every country, a body that would be would have a youth advisory capacity for national climate policy. And in V4, there is already such a youth climate council up and running in Poland, and uh, it is bringing results. And what is also important uh, for all V4 countries to take note is invest in preparing young negotiators for COP. This is, an, I can't stress it enough, that will be an extremely good investment because as I said, only when you combine the activist pressure and the ability to influence it from the room where it happens, actual change happens. And now briefly about the youth advisory group itself. So the, the reason why the secretary general decided to establish the youth advisory group is connected to the updates in his climate strategy. Uh, that he provided. Uh, now it is more focused on uh, his uh, six climate positive actions that are primarily revolving around uh, leaving no one behind, to working together, not bailing out uh, fossil fuel industries, investing in just transition and green jobs. And uh, the seven of us who are part of the youth advisory group, we are not only assembled, you know, in uh, the spirit of gender and regional balance, we also represent uh, quite uh, important different perspectives, professionally speaking. Like, for instance, I'm uh, the point, the sort of the point man on uh, economics, if we could say it like that. And the, for instance, the chair of our group, uh, Nisreen El Sain from Sudan, uh, she is our point person on uh, technology transfer, and she herself is a negotiator at COP on behalf of African uh, Club of Negotiators. Uh, so, and uh, the mandate of the group is uh, basically to make sure that we convey youth messages to the Secretary General in uh, the framework of uh, this climate strategy in order for him to be able to update it to make sure that uh, the stakeholders involved in its implementation are held accountable and that we break the ice in sort of how those uh, within the UN system can themselves react at the trends when it comes in policymaking, in activism, 
and sort of we want to provide a fresh perspective that is both passionate and professional at the same time in order to overcome the multiple challenges that are facing uh, us not only in 2020 but will be facing us further within the sort of what is happening in, in climate crisis per se but also with the challenges that are adjacent to it Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vladislav. And I, I really think that establishing this, uh, the youth advisory group is, is a first step and, and there is still so much to do to, to really make this decision making process inclusive and also accessible for all youth who would like to um attend so uh thank you uh for this and uh, now um we are moving to the 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 q a um uh, question and answers uh, section of our discussion and we received a question from tibor farago uh concerning uh the global implementation so how we as as to be foreign and this region can can also take our part in in the overall uh, global effort to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions so maybe uh, barbara um, i i would like to ask this question from you i think that the eu is a bird reader in climate action and has played a very active role throughout the international process and, and is committed to implementing the paris agreement and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the SDGs within the EU and in development cooperation with partner countries. Uh, uh, the EU is front runner in policy making. The implementation of the European Green Deal is ongoing and will be embodied in a robust policy framework package, providing a best practice to all other nations and regions to adopt ambitious sustainable economic policy packages. And as I said, the Visegrad 4 has all the regional experience. Uh, in this respect that can really set an example to all those countries outside the EU that uh, have the same problems as these countries within the EU. Thank you, Barbara. Um, any other panelists who would like to comment on, on this question? I mean, I can offer just one brief thought, but I would more or less uh, go back to what I think Vladislav uh, and Anilia both mentioned before, which is that demonstrating that the transition can be just is a very important way of helping the rest of the world, if you want to see that this is possible to do successfully. And if that can be demonstrated in practice in real time uh, in this region, that will be of huge importance in addition to all the other contributions to, to the EU uh emissions targets being met and the, the you know the wider success if you want so i would just say uh what they said before is worth underlining thank you martin and and now um i have another question uh for you that relates to to competitive sustainability and in the first part of the discussion we said that we would go a bit more into into detail so my question would be if um if you could bring a few examples which are the industries um uh, where where we as as the european union and the region have a competitive advantage um on in the global area so um well we've been looking at uh, this on a sort of pan-european basis and some of this obviously therefore applies to the the v4 some uh, less so but i think um of the of the five major areas uh of emissions reduction that are necessary so you look at buildings industry agriculture and so on um buildings is an area that offers uh, I think, as Anelia said, huge opportunities just in terms of efficiency improvement in the first instance. And obviously, after that, the, the need to achieve carbon neutral buildings, essentially, as well. And the, uh, the experience that, that European uh, companies have in those areas um, is, is huge. So there's a lot of potential for uh, improvement in, uh, in the countries of the V4 as well as the EU more widely in that area but also for the companies operating in that area to, to almost to export their experience in, in doing that from, from that region to other parts of the world. And that's where sustainability in that sense starts to become competitive because uh, it's, it's certainly the case that other countries will be doing 
the same sort of thing, uh, if not immediately, very soon afterwards. And if your companies have the experience, the technical know-how, maybe the intellectual property, uh, the capability to, to, to sell those sorts of products and services outside of, of the region, then that's an enormous opportunity in, in these uh, growing markets. So buildings uh, is certainly one area. Um, there are other areas um, of uh, innovation in the sort of mobility uh, supply chain, for example, where uh, I think there are also big opportunities in, in the region um, uh, to capitalize on changes already underway, uh, whether those are in batteries or, or smart mobility more broadly, um, and indeed combining uh, public uh, and private transport together, so integrated transport systems. Um, there are um, obviously um, areas that the EU or companies and um, uh, so regions of the EU have excelled in some uh, renewable energies and those are ripe for further exploitation and exporting now. Uh, there are counter examples of course and almost the best uh, example of where we haven't succeeded in competitive sustainability in the past uh, was uh, solar panels where there was a market created uh, in Europe and the, the the most successful sort of exploiters of that market were from overseas China notably um, so the question is how to both create the market and enable uh, the industries uh, locally to be able to to benefit from that to supply those markets um, and to then uh, lead and export uh, beyond that but I think uh, certainly buildings certainly areas of energy mobility uh, and those renewable technologies are, are clearly areas where there is potential both in the region and uh, internationally for, 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 for V4 companies and countries to, to excel. If I may add to that. Yes, yes, of course. Um, indeed. Thank you, Mart uh, Martin. I think it's really, you made a great um, overview. And uh, my addition would be indeed that um, let's look also at the uh, what uh, the region is reach out. I mean, to really link with sustainability and sustainability goals, I think we really need to look also at resources and um, uh, see countries is, is a region which is one of the regions in terms of biodiversity and biodiversity protection and is important. And I see, I do believe also what motivates a lot of people to be out on the street and protect their areas. Uh, I mean, I do sometimes often being on the, um, when, they're, when they're in a threat is making that sea, sea countries also uh, city, citizens are really well connected to the nature. Uh, so nature-based solution, investing into the protection of the biodiversity um, is another area which is not, un, is very under, under underexplored and could be providing either job, more jobs, more opportunities, more solutions also for the for the current health health for health crisis because uh, linking with the with the question which is also in the chat, uh, what the pandemic also learned uh, teach us that um, a lot of challenges and changes which we had um, recently are linked to the to the exploitation of the biodiversity and not preserve not preserving early limits of the of the planet. And uh, we do still have a lot of, uh, of rich uh, forests, and um, and we could do do more to be protecting them and 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 producing the products which will be uh, important for our health system, for well-being of the citizens. And connected to that is agriculture. Agriculture and building local um, uh, agriculture is something which Central and European countries work quite good at, and uh, it's important to probably look again back at that. Um, and restore the the faith and the importance of the of being building the the health health uh, healthy agriculture system and and supply chain. Um, this is another area which creates a lot of jobs. If it's possible, I would also like to add a little bit. Yeah. So I think uh, in terms of the source of competitiveness for sustainability in Europe, we should look at it uh, from uh, three perspectives. From energy perspective, I think the Europe is uh, the best place to, to exceed in uh, offshore wind, in uh, geothermal and in tidal wave energy. And uh, you know, while the first one sounds pretty conventional, the, the latter two are more of outliers, particularly the last one, but actually, and when it comes to the tidal wave, uh, Europe is absolute leader by capacity worldwide right now. And uh, this is a source of um, an uh, extreme potential advantage and uh, needs to be leveraged. 
Uh, also, the hydrogen and uh, carbon capture and storage are extremely important, and uh, these are the sources of competitiveness that should be particularly important for V4 countries. Uh, the reason being that um, in V4, uh, there is a massive infrastructure available that uh, was uh, used to transporting natural gas and will still be used for transporting natural gas. But at the same time, it can be repurposed also for uh, the development of hydrogen economy as well and uh, to store carbon as well. Moreover, uh, if we will see a switch uh, in uh, the European automotive industry towards uh, greater attention uh, to producing uh, hydrogen cell cars, which would certainly happen. Uh, it is again, uh, should be on the spotlight of uh, uh, V4 countries in terms of their industrial strategy, because there is a lot of automotive capacity uh, based in uh, V4, like say the plant, I think it's the plant by uh, BMW in uh, Dior. Uh, and uh, it is extremely important that uh, the new generation cars are also find, uh, find their best environment for production in V4. So that is uh, a thing that we need to follow. And obviously the clean tech sector should uh, deserve our close attention, particularly clean steel and cement. And here I can talk a little bit also from a family perspective because uh, my uh, father-in-law is actually directly involved uh, in um, running a project uh, in uh, Arctic Sweden. Uh, about uh, Clean Steel, uh, the company that is operating their LKAB, they are actually already thus launching a fully carbon neutral steel plant. And uh, the last but not the least is also non-industrial services, particularly financial services, consulting services that are related to sustainability, serving green bonds and markets for green financial instruments. But here the, policy, the EU policymakers have some homework to do, and namely finally finishing the capital markets union because this market will not fly if there are no finally integrated deep enough capital markets. Without that, all the expertise that is accumulated in this sphere will just uh, serve those markets who are deeper and more liquid, like the US, for instance. Uh, thank you, Vladislav. And now we, we really touched upon quite a few industries where uh, it seems that we we, we have uh, a competitive advantage. And um, I would like to ask um, uh, you, Barbara, about bringing some examples from, from Hungary and maybe from, from the region where you really see that an industry um, has become uh, both more competitive and sustainable. Well, in Hungary, I think it's basically car production that is uh, leading uh, uh, in, the, in, in the industrial uh, production. And uh, what we see that both in the production and also in the supply side, that those companies which uh, uh, pay a lot of attention on diversifying their, their supply uh, channels and also diversify their portfolios can, uh, can survive in this environment. And those who prepare for the challenges, especially for the immense electrification that is at hand. And also this COVID situation has taught us one really good lesson that shortening the supply chains, and it's not only in car production, but in every single industry, shortening the supply chains, bringing all segments of production closer to uh, the end production is something that, uh, that can help us uh, 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 becoming more sustainable in the short, in, in the long run. The other thing is carbon leakage that uh, can uh, affect the EU in general. And by carbon leakage, I mean that those uh, industries that are exposed to uh, carbon price uh, within the European emission trading scheme uh, can suffer from the threat of carbon leakage. And uh, especially in this region, uh, where we are close to the EU border, we can feel the threat of that. So there any industry that is under the emission trading scheme in Hungary can easily choose to go to neighboring countries, which are not under the ETS legislation, to avoid this uh, burden. So I think that uh, at this edge of the European Union, we are more exposed to this. And uh, hopefully this uh, problem will be solved by the carbon border adjustment tax that might be levied to some of the industries uh, that, would need, that would need to be protected from this threat in the future. Uh, 
But back to Vladislava, I, I would be really happy to go for anything within the V4, which is uh, on youth issues and youth secretariat. Uh, currently, the Hungarian government is working on the long term uh, strategy, clean development strategy, the long term strategy towards 2050. And we organized a lot of uh, sort of climate virtual breakfasts to uh, discuss these issues with, the, with all kinds of stakeholders, including through the young the youth and that was one of the most exciting session that we had and also we were asking for written uh, um, uh, written uh, uh, answers and suggestions from the young generation that we could include in this 2050 long-term strategy and i have to say that the that the most valuable uh, list of suggestions that the Hungarian government received was from actually a 17 year old uh, living and studying in the southeastern part of Hungary, and I've never ever um, uh, read so in-depth analysis of what is happening here in Hungary right now in the region. And if I could, I would hire that guy immediately. The problem is that he doesn't even have a, a BAC or doesn't even have an A-level exam, not even a university exam. But but I think we we hold a great uh, hope in the future generation to solve these issues as we are working on their future anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Barbara, for uh, for your um, uh, remarks, and um, I'm just quickly looking uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, the questions. So um, we have a question from uh, from Palfi uh, Barnabas. He's one of uh, one, one of our um, V4SDG members. And um, his question is that although 25% uh, of the next uh, EU's MFF budget is designated to, to climate action, however, there we still see inconsistencies uh, which contradict with the, with, the, with the Paris Agreement. So uh, in, this, in this context, how substantial uh, you think that this contribution to climate action is? So this is a, an open question to you, to the panel. <laughs> I will just respond to this with three words, common agricultural policy. So yeah, it is still, it, it is still gonna be a problem. And I think the passage of CAP in the shape it was formed and uh, approved in the European Parliament shows us that uh, not everything is ideal when it comes to uh, the climate policy and climate budgeting in the EU and uh, we certainly can do better. And that's why actually we, we, need, the, we need the youth to advocate for that and to make uh, ourselves uh, least, uh, like make ourselves a force to reckon with. Because if you look at the final vote, for instance, uh, that was happening in the European Parliament, uh, it was nice to see how European Social Democrats have actually listened and switched to the sites. And though it still has not assured uh, the prevent prevention of the outcome for the CEP, it was still a good sign. As well as when uh, the European Parliament actually stepped up to the greenhouse uh, gas emissions target compared to that one agreed in the Council. So there is definitely room for improvement and youth could actually be and should be the main agent for change. I Thank you, you Vlad. And, uh, and I would like to... Yes, if, if, if you would like to comment, uh, comment on this, I, I was. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that indeed, uh, I fully agree with what is that um, one of the big uh, contradictions of today, Green Deal, is the common agriculture policy, which was supposed to is supposed to deliver a big, big part of the climate investments and biodiversity protection investments, but it's not yet um, up to the to the to the task, uh, and we still hope that uh, with the uh, through the work on operational programs and here again back to the role of, life, of civil society it, um, and uh, designing the national plans, we could probably still uh, change and move towards uh, more greener uh, agriculture investments. Uh, but from the other side, just to mention that also overall um, the budget is supposed to be 30%. Um, 30% of the budget should be climate friendly and, and many of the objectives 
you um, like the, um, the RDF, the cohesion structural funds, they have objective of 37% of the both climate and environmental uh, objective. The same currently is discussed of the recovery and resilience to be up to 40% of climate and environmental. So, I mean, this is really a great message, great, great um, uh, that a lot of funding would be dedicated to uh, to the climate investments um, and at least on with the tax, with many of the funds nowadays linked to the taxonomy, uh, which is the new tool which is developed currently um, at the EU level to ensure sustainability of the finance. We we hope that also the rest of the funding would be not harmful because this is we don't only need the positive investment but we also need to ensure that um, there is no harm produced by the by the rest of the investments and um, this um, at least uh, for the moment a lot of discussions yet but uh, the hope is that there will be exclusion of the certain harmful investments like fossil fuels waste uh, regeneration uh, or reduction redu reducing the amount of lock-ins uh, we could have in the in in the region and, um, and capitalizing or in providing opportunity as i said before uh, we see a lot of opportunities to be in uh, in in the in the new solutions in the in the green in digital solutions uh, and we count a lot of young professionals to to help and uh, and build uh, the capacity uh, for those in uh, in our region so we should look uh, forward about uh, about and not be scared about these targets uh, i was just going to say more or less what uh, anelia said actually because i think um Clearly, there are inconsistencies and misalignments at the moment. Uh, that said, I think it is important to recognise the uh, the efforts being made to uh, to increase the extent of funding that goes to uh, the right climate uh, action. Uh, the test is in its implementation and the, the use of the taxonomy, the greater use of the taxonomy, uh, the rigorous use of the taxonomy in more areas will be how we can be sure that uh, it has the right effect, because obviously until it's actually deployed using those criteria amongst others then uh, it remains uh, rhetorical um, and the test will be how it's actually implemented but I fully agree with what others have said thank you and yes really like I think our, our discussion really couldn't be couldn't be more topical than than heads of states and governments will, will discuss these questions and and I, I think we share this hope that um, more ambitious targets um, will, will be agreed. Um, and we are coming to the end of our time very soon, so we have time for one or two uh, more questions. So we have a question from Federica Feit concerning the, the COVID crisis and, uh, and, and climate change. So we are still early to tell. Um, however, how do you, um, so do you think that, that the, the current pandemic rather had um, a positive or negative effect on, on climate change. And of course, it's a short term um, evaluation um, that we can make now, but uh, we would be interested in hearing your opinion on this. Yes, Vladislav, uh, if you can start. Yeah. I think I belong to, the, to that sad minority of people who is more pessimistic about the impact of the pandemic on climate action uh, for the following reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, when it comes to how we will fare in terms of our climate performance after COVID is uh, depending a lot on the composition of our COVID relief packages. And uh, unfortunately, it is extremely unsatisfying. Uh, the amount of money have, that have literally gone to waste in those packages is alarming. And uh, in that order of ideas, I would like you, when you have the opportunity, to go to the special web page that was uh, designed by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is called Energy Policy Tracker, to and to see the because the tracker analyzes uh, the amount of money that is spent by G20 countries on uh, subsidizing and supporting renewables energy the new renewable energy sector versus the fossil fuels. And you will get shocked uh, by the amount of money that was only in 2020 spent on propping up fossil fuel subsidies. That, that is a figure that has already surpassed $200 billion. Those are the money that are locked in in harmful things for the environment that we will not get back. 
200 billion dollars borrowed at the time of the lowest interest rates of ever available in developed countries and at the same time we have an international debt crisis looming in the background the imf has forestalled that for the most vulnerable countries by 20 by mid 2021 but nobody knows what will happen after that but most likely what we will see happening is a very steep fiscal correction that will be focused on uh, making sure that there is immediate healthcare relief and uh, some also and the repayments of the debts are prioritized and climate action mostly likely without any support to that uh, will be mixed uh, which is especially alarming considering the 2020 is a year where all of us uh, all of the countries participants of the paris agreement should uh, submit their updated ndcs and that's why uh, in uh, my role as member of the youth advisory group i constantly advocate for imf and uh, the members uh, of the board there to activate the instrument that was known uh, in previous uh, previous years as debt for nature swaps but to use it as uh, an instrument to prop the most vulnerable countries ndcs debt for ndcs so the part of their debt would be converted for the resources for those countries to maintain their climate ambition without that i, I think unfortunately we may stall in our climate ambition or even thrown back because of COVID. And I see that Martin, um, you also um, uh, like to comment on this. Yeah, I, um, let me be the other side of the uh, of the argument and uh, um, express a, a hope that actually it uh, is going to help accelerate a lot of the changes uh, in society that we needed to see anyway and the, the change of, of mindset that essentially it's um, opened up in some areas of our life will make those changes happen more quickly or more easily than would have been the case beforehand so i don't disagree with uh, what he said about the um uh, the misinvestment uh, that we are start with, that we are seeing and the need to not lock ourselves into some uh, stranded assets essentially uh, with all of the risk the risk and issues that go with that um but at the same time, we've also seen uh, enormous changes in the energy markets uh, over the last six to nine months, um, which I think will have a long term impact in the way that um, investors and uh, those sectors uh, respond to this challenge. Um, and I think obviously that you need to weigh up these two trends together. Um, they happen at different paces, but uh, I'm, I'm less pessimistic although I totally understand what Vladislav was saying, um, but it will only happen if uh, organizations like yours, Vladislav's, obviously, Anelia's, um, Barbara and co, if we, we hold ourselves and, and the institutions that are working on this to account. Um, it's only by doing that that essentially the, the change will happen. Um, but I do think it's, it's um, galvanized a, a sort of, uh, the opportunity for a reset is greater now than it was 12 months ago. Uh, whether we take that opportunity is obviously something that we have to be very conscious of, but uh, the opportunity lies there with all the horrible side of uh, COVID well understood. Um, we need to seize this moment, definitely. Um, yes, I see. Um, Barbara, please. I think it's it's very interesting and very controversial issue. Just let's talk about home office. Now, now I'm at home, so this is a virtual conference, but previously I was at my workplace which means that there is double energy use in my workplace and, uh, and in my home. And although in the offices there are less and less people working, uh, the energy used for, this, for the maintenance of this office space is exactly the same because the, the smart system are still lacking from these buildings. And it's a huge problem. So we, we have to, to learn not to double everything, not to double the energy uh, consumption. So there are some primary effects of uh, the COVID situation. Uh, there are some advantages and there are some uh, disadvantages. So uh, advantages, what, what are the primary effects? Re uh, reduced commuting time, reduced office space, reduced as as associated um, operating costs and energy costs. Secondary effects, uh, there is reduced traffic congestion, that's good. And there is improved energy efficiency behaviors at home because telecommuters pay for energy use at home for them, themselves and not at work. But what are the disadvantages? On short term, the primary effects are uh, 
The disadvantage is that there is increased energy use at home for lighting, for everything. Um, uh, and increased reliance on ICT for work-related communication and associated energy use infrastructure, more home office space required, which may mean larger homes and higher energy use. Uh, at the secondary effects, it's also in, in, interesting that there is increased transportation energy because teleworkers opt to live further from their workplace and thus potentially further from amenities and in less transit accessible neighborhoods and there is increased commute time and distance because teleworkers tend to live further from their workplace and uh, increase the uh, non-commuting trips for errands at uh, for uh, alimentation because teleworkers cannot integrate those into commute uh, commutes uh, and there are also larger homes that are more affordable away from teleworkers central office and thus more so Meant, it's really a controversial topic, and if we don't have a look at both sides of the same coin, we will not learn from uh, uh, the lessons that we have learned during uh, the COVID, and we will not learn how to make uh, the changes in our lifestyles because of the COVID situation more sustainable. So there is a lot to, to learn in this uh, uh, issue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Anelia? Yeah, last point for me, and I, I agree with all uh, all the speakers. Um, just just one thing which I wanted to flag. Indeed, uh, there is a lot of uh, things still to be assessed, and uh, we need to um, we need to look deeper in, in, in the climate impacts and social economic impacts which the, the COVID unfortunately would have on our economies. Um, one aspect which is uh, which I'm concerned is democracy and democracy, democratic decision making, um, especially in this moment where now we're deciding about how we spend uh, this enormous amount of funding uh, which is, is coming for us. So we really need to look more carefully and encouraging, I mean also like people like you to be actively looking and um, at uh, and be holding accountable decision makers because we need to decide uh, decide together. Uh, the, this is the um, the process which um, need to be owned by the citizen, by the interest group, by business, and um, we need more transparency. This this things was a bit forgotten in the, in the last um, last months because of course the crisis is the is is driving decision making. Uh, but uh, we need to come back to the basics of democracy. But even inventing the new ways to be more democratic and uh, and involve people and technologies here probably could be of help uh, but we need to really be more active nowadays so i want to finish on the positive side let's let's try to do more of us uh, of what we do already thank you uh thank you anelia and um yes i i i i, I do agree that there is two sides of a of a coin and and I'm I'm also more on the on the positive side, and I do hope that this will be the push uh, that's uh, that's so much uh, needed in this um, in the, in the area of of, of climate action. And um, we are almost at the end of uh, of our time, and I would like to have one last question to 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 all of my uh, all of our panelists so as we discussed that now we are setting higher ambitions both on european level um, and on the global stage and the the next year really would would be about implementation and 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 living up to those uh, to those promises and and ambitions and uh, i would like to ask you that um, what are like the, the most important steps to, to, to get there in the coming year? So, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, if you could open this last round. I think we have been talking a lot about trust transition and the key aspect is that no one should be left behind. So this is a huge jump, a huge green and digital jump that we are ahead of and this can only be done if, if everybody is, is on board, if everybody has access to all the resources and no one is left behind, no single household is left behind in going to a brighter and greener future. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think actually um, in the short term, uh, we've mentioned this already several times, but the amount of public money that is going to be deployed over the next 12 months as a result of the recovery uh, funding 
and the leverage that could have on private capital as well is an enormous opportunity. Uh, if we don't get that right, we will have missed uh, the time that would be most important to, to set in train a lot of these other points. Um, so it's actually less what we do uh, at the next COP uh, and in the run up to it than how we actually take decisions on those types of immediate questions facing us um, that are right now, essentially. So um, I think the funding question is crucial. Thank you, Anelia. Um, I agree <laughs> very much. We do we do look at that very um, with a bit of concern, but also with a, a lot of hope. Um, and indeed, uh, no nobody should be left behind uh, because we, we we believe now more than ever as the SDGs are important. Gender issues, and inclusion of the of the people of the, the and. The, the poor or not the disabled people uh, serving the serving uh, all the different needs of the society are, are important to be included in that but really need to look look long term and um, avoid lock-ins because we we need to divest from certain type of industries and invest in solutions which will be really long term and um, good for your children thank you and uh, Vladislav Thank you. And before I jump on this, I just want to make a clarification on the previous matter because they came up an impression of me as a little bit of prof prophet of doom. And uh, more of a midterm, uh, long term perspective, I still remain more of an optimist. But I think that in the perspective of the next two or three years, there is sort of an overestimation of the benefits and an underestimation of the costs right now. Uh, coming back to uh, your question here, I think that uh, for us uh, for youth, the utmost priority for uh, the next years should be more of a coalition building on the, the urban rural lines, uh, because uh, in Europe we still see that the climate movement is uh, still significantly urban biased, and uh, that has its implications, unfortunately, when uh, we are doing the outreach, particularly to the region that are in the direst need of just transition. That's the first point. And the second point, I think that uh, we need to work towards uh, establishing more uh, functional intersectional coalitions, uh, because even though I myself am not a fan of this, um, how should I put it, UN approach when they say that everything is connected with everything, uh, but uh, you, you know, we need to realize that there are certain important uh, connections that are going from climate from SDG 13 to other SDGs which uh, when transformed into policies, into sound policies, will have a significant impact over the livelihood of youth in uh, V4 countries, like for instance climate education, like for instance green jobs. That's why in the Youth Advisory Group I uh, am advocating for creating a special mechanism that could be replicated across many countries in that regard in the training for green jobs called Green Youth Guarantee. And I think that V4 and the European Union actually need a Green Youth Guarantee because otherwise we will end up with climate crisis, COVID crisis, and youth unemployment crisis all, all of that time drowning us into them. And uh, to conclude, I would just like to thank you for this opportunity and to let you know that uh, in my person, uh, the V4 countries and the countries of Eastern Europe overall have an advocate of their cause in uh, the UN and in the Youth Advisory Group. Thank you, Vladislav, and, um, and, and I, I would like to conclude uh, our session. Um, once again, thank you to, to accept our invitations, and I, I uh, a lot of, uh, lot of very, of, of climate action where we are um, where we are lagging behind and where we made progress and I think um, overall um, we can say uh, uh, that um, this is really the moment to do and and put the ambitions and 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 think Uh, thank you once again. 
And uh, now, Lila, if you could share um, the screen. So um, we at uh, V4SDG, we talk now, uh, during this discussion, we talked a lot about uh, the connections SDG 17 and how partnership for the goals is crucial and this is why we at, uh, at V4SDG launched uh, V4SDG Connect um, which is the first online sustainability network uh, and, and platform in the region so we just uh, quickly would like to introduce it to you and we do hope that we can take the discussion forward uh, here. So we might have some some technical issues, but uh, but we will uh, we will definitely share how you could how you could join us and and we do hope to to continue uh, this discussion with uh, with all of you. And once again, thank you uh, thank you for the panelists for accepting and being here with us today, and also all the attendees who who, who joined us and the great questions uh, that also drove the the discussion. So. Thank you and uh, I wish you a, a great evening all.